Hello. So, um, those who know me know that uh, I'm a very passionate people, and the problem with passionate people is they tend to go crazy and have no boundaries. So, that's what I did. First, a little about myself. My name is Leticia Avro. I'm a PostgreSQL recognized contributor. I'm a PostgreSQL your board member. I'm the co-founder of Postgres Women. Uh, I have a evil plan in two steps. The first step is bring more women into conferences. Second step is once they're there, why not put them on stage? And also, I'm currently working at ADB as a field CTO. Uh, a lot of people have no idea what field CTO means. So it does not mean that I work on the fields. Uh, field CTO, uh, you know that when you're a CTO, you have two sides of the job. You have the very interesting part, tech, and you have the more boring part about management, uh, hiring, dashboards, meetings, lengthy meetings for days, and things like that. I only do the interesting part of the job, which is great. If you want to follow me on social media, I'm on Fosterden. Uh, actually, my name is pretty rare, so if you just but Avro, you will find me and also a company in Israel that I'm not related to. And also Avro without a T, Apache Avro, I'm not responsible for that. Um, I have a blog where from time to time when I prioritize it, I can write some things. Uh, the audience of my blog is mainly myself so that when I learn something, I can find it again later. But uh, I thought that publishing it might be profitable for everyone. I'm also responsible for that tiny website, PSQL Tips. If you don't know it, it's just a website that will at random give you a tip about PSQL, because I found out that not so many people knew how amazing that tool is. Also, um, my slides are very clean and pure with jokes in background images, but not so many words. I know that for some reason, you might need to have the annotated slides, the ones with the bullet points. If you need them, just feel free to use the QR code. That's the, this slide deck with the bullet point will be the one that I will publish on the PostgreSQL Conf, uh, Postgres Conf Europe website. So. Let's enter what we want to discuss about. So uh, the idea was to learn SQL. I've been, uh, so as most of us, I learned SQL during my, uh, uh, in my engineering school. Then I found out that what I learned was already obsolete because I was learning SQL 92. Well, uh, I'm not very young, but I'm not that old. So, um, I, thought I was first. I was very furious at my, uh, my teacher to have taught me something totally obsolete, and then I said that we, I could canalize this anger into learning the SQL the right way. So uh, this presentation will be in three parts. First, I will explain what I did and the kind of rules I uh, and constraints I give to myself. Then I will talk about some techniques that I will use several times. And then, of course, the most important, what I learned. So, have you heard about Advent of Code? Who's, who knows about Advent of Code? Okay, great. So you know how much fun it is. Advent of Code is a yearly code challenge. Each day, one, uh, one first challenge is revealed, and if you solve it, you're entitled to try to solve the second challenge. And each time you will gather golden stars so that could, you can save the elves and Christmas. You don't have to do that every day. You can do, as long as the challenge is revealed, you have an eternity of time to solve it. Uh, next month, I was still trying to solve last year challenge. It's fine, it's okay, because the main goal is having fun, so fun is not something you can have only on Christmas. It's something you can have every day. Um, also, there are some 
kind of progression in the difficulty of the challenges. So the challenges from the 1st of December are normally very easy, but this year was not that easy, at least the second one. Um, and it becomes harder and harder, I let say, and harder and harder. Uh, also, challenges from Sundays are supposed to be a little harder because you're supposed to have more time on Sunday. So I guess this guy has no children. And um, so take your time, solve it uh, when you have your time, when it's fun. If it stops being fun, stop doing it, simply. There's no pressure. There, will, there won't be any product owner or project manager that will rush you with you into uh, solving this advent of code challenge. The elves are very patient, so you're fine. Um, then, the challenge is open to everyone wanting to solve it in any way. So last year, AI was allowed. This year, AI is not allowed, or the need to compete in some kind of different category. So there's no mandatory language. As long as your language is evolved enough, let's say that it, should, it, it needs to be true and complete because if it's not, then it would be difficult to solve, it, uh, to solve all the challenges. So if you can choose your language and you need a, a Turing complete language, then I can do it in SQL because SQL is Turing complete. Uh, if you're unsure about the Turing completeness of SQL, the wiki of Postgres has two formal demonstration of a Turing machine explaining how uh, SQL is Turing complete. So, now that I had decided to do it in SQL, I needed some rules because, of course, I could have said, so I will do it in SQL, then I will install the, uh, in Postgres, I will install the PL, PL Python extension, and I will do it in Python. That would be cheating. So, I put some rules. It will be SQL only. SQL is the only language that I allow myself to solve these strategies. Well, Postgres flavored SQL. I'm allowed to use non-standard SQL features of Postgres. I'm allowed to create functions and procedures if I want it. I'm allowed to create as many tables as I want. I've actually, I'm allowed to create as many objects as I want, but I'm not allowed to create extensions. Um, also, I will be using the, last, the latest version of Postgres. So last year it was Postgres 16, this year it's Postgres 17. Who is running Postgres 17 on their laptop? You should be all running Postgres 17 on your laptop. <laughs> so, um, and the good thing with using the latest version of Postgres is first you can test it. So that's also good for the community. Uh, for example, last year I found a documentation bug where functions that did not exist were uh, listed in the documentation of Postgres because there were some changes in the, in the patch that uh, added the functions. So it's also good for the community. So first things I learned. The first thing I learned is I know nothing. I'm very, very bad at SQL. Uh, there's no way I can solve it. Well, actually, I did solve some things, but um, it was very, very, very difficult. Then uh, I have no brain and no memory, so I need the documentation constantly. So it's, it's as if uh, I use a function, the next day I need the same function, I still need the documentation to look. And if I need the same function for 10 days in a row, I will still look at the documentation to know how to use it. Uh, my brain is very, very twisty and overcomplicated, and I will add myself burdens by, because I'm not simple and I will use a weird twisted way to reach the goal instead of a straight line. So yeah, that's how I, I am, and well, you do with whatever you have. <laughs> and also the last thing I thought is SQL is definitely not meant to do that. Um, first thing, I had to create a repository to store my code. So I had to structure it. So I created an advent of code repository, 
and then I added a language. So language, actually, I added that uh, in October because I learned a new language, Vlang, and so I had to add a, a new kind of part to. So I added the language here, and then the year, the day, and under that you will have al always the same files. An example.csv file. It's uh, in each advent of code, when they describe what you, the challenge you have to solve, there is an example and how it's solved on the example. Then you have your full output that will allow you to solve the challenge. And then the input.csv is simply a copy for either example or either full.csv. And then you have the solution called solution, because I love simple things from time to time. Um, then you want to begin. And first thing you say, I have to load my data. I have to load either the example.csv or the uh, full.csv. Well, actually, I called them CSV, but it's not mandatory, it's just because I felt more uh, comfortable doing that. So the first thing you do when you load your data is you want to keep the raw input. You don't want to mess up with your table and have to redo, redo everything again, or uh, it's easier to debug if you keep the raw uh, input. Then you will add an ID so that you, have the, you can sort the rows in the exact same order that they are in your file, because depending on the challenge, the order is very important. Um, to load the data, you will use simply a copy. So here, I'm copying my data, in, uh, well, my data from input.csv into the data column from the input table. And uh, see, here is an example of uh, from uh, this year's first day. The input, ex uh, the example input was that. So you have. For each line, you have a series of letters and digits. So that's the kind of thing that you will load into your data column. The data column is always text, and then you will parse it. Then I ran into another issue. I don't know you, but I'm not able to do a simple SQL query without any mistake. So I had to run it several times. and. The problem is, as I was worried about performance, and you know that when you load some data to have better performance, you need to vacuum analyze it after loading, you can't put that in a single transaction and work back at the end, because you can't run a vacuum inside a, tra uh, a transaction. So I found a way to do that by dropping a schema if it existed. The schema is called AOC with the number of the day. Uh, so that I can work on two different days at the same time. And then I will create a schema and I will set a search path so that I don't have to worry about it. It will always uh, create my object in that schema. And don't forget the cascade to make sure that you can drop your schema. So then each time I was running my script, I was sure that it was it impotent and I will recreate everything. So data types, that's the fun part. You had to think out, so first you will load everything into a text column and then you will have to parse it. And as I'm working with tables uh, and so on, I had to work with data types. So of course numbers and with advent of code, not for the first day, but uh, when the time goes, uh, Really, you might prefer big int to int because the guy makes sure that you will go uh, over the range of int, of integers, just to make things a little more complicated. So numbers, text, of course. Uh, sometimes you have some challenges. You can, uh, well, you can use bit strings and you can use logical operation like uh, end, or and so on. I worked a lot with ranges, and I, I love them. They are very, very efficient. And also, um, from time to time, you have challenges where the input file is some kind of a map. So you have um, 
let's say, uh, eight columns by eight rows. And uh, on, some uh, on some of this position, you have some values. In that case, you might want to use geometric data types like points, lines, and polygons. And then that's where performance might become a problem. So as I said, you might want to vacuum analyze your input table after loading data, because uh, the optimizer of Postgres is running, a, is using statistics to make sure that um, it's using the best path. And then you might want some indexes. So here, for example, I added a simple bitter index on uh, two columns. Here is the perfect example of a map. So this notation here is because P is of the kind uh, the data type point. So here is X and here is Y. These are co coordinates to the point. And also, this is less good as, as um, than the GIST, GIST index that you calculate directly on the point, depending on what kind of operation you're doing, what kind of reads you know, you might want to do. So just try it out. It's a, normally you shouldn't get a very serious performance issue or your algorithm is not very efficient, which can happen. I have made my laptop run for two days without any result. I put my, uh, my limit to two days. I think that if it's not solved, it run for two days and it's not solved, then it's not good enough. So the most useful tools and tips. So I already said how PSQL is the best tool you can use uh, for Postgres. Actually, it's the only official client, client for Postgres. Um, and what I love with it is it's very efficient and it's lightweight. The problem is the learning curve is way slower than a great tool. So why would you go into such a pain to use PSQL where you can use your GUI tool. Um, I was a production DBA for a long time, and I found out that when you're called at 2 a.m., and don't ask me why, but it's always crashing at 2 a.m., and then you have to connect to the host to find out what's going on. Uh, of course, you will lose time because a VPN is done through and so on. But once you're connected, then you find out that you can't connect, you can't use your Wii tool because it does not work. Do you think that at 2 a.m. it's time to learn a complicated command line tool if you're not used to it to solve a production problem? I don't think that's the right time to do that. So if you're running on production, I really encourage you to learn PSQL before. Uh, before there's a problem at 2 a.m. and you're stuck and you have to learn it. And uh, you will find out by using it again and again and again that it, actually it is a very, very good tool. And as I said, it's efficient. It's the, yeah, it's the most efficient tool I've found. And as I'm an engineer, efficiency does matter to me. Also, you can get help on SQL command, like here. If you don't remember how to create a function, then you simply use the meta command backslash h and the begin of your SQL command, and PSQL will give you uh, everything you need. And if you want a description on a function from the Postgres documentation, you simply ask, describe function, reg abstract. Actually, that's where there is a documentation bug. Uh, and also, PSQL has auto-completion, which is great. So uh, I really encourage you to use that great tool. Something I used a lot is generate series. So that's a Postgres function that will generate numbers or timestamp, depending on what you, uh, between two values uh, with a given step. So here, for example, I will generate all the number between one and the maximum ID I have in my table input. Oh, here, when you have a map, it might be useful to generate all the points that you have in your map. So as I said, for the first example, if you have eight columns and eight rows, then it will generate the 64 points from your map. 
um, you might want to use with ordinal, ordinal, ordinality uh, if you need it. For example, here, I, uh, so my entry was uh, pairs of numbers, but in the same lines, I had several pairs. And the only way to know which one was the first one and which was, was the second one was the first one was even num uh, the, the even position of the number was the first one and the odd e position of the number was the second one. So I generated two series here, uh, the odd numbers with a step of two and here the even numbers. And then I could create, uh, uh, I, I, I could get all my numbers in uh, arrays. Uh, no, I actually, sorry, I created ranges because I love ranges. And as you see, I had to use big int because integers were not enough. So you can imagine the number of numbers I had. Uh, also, each time I do a cross join, I, I have the habit to explain that it's not a problem because it's a cross join with a one row table. That's important. Um, so that's how I, I did things. Um, and uh, with ordinality, uh, if you don't use it, you have no guarantee in the order that you will get these numbers. Then uh, I use generating columns. I love them. So first for the ID, the ID I didn't use simply integer. I use generated always as an identity. So that's my favorite way of created uh, auto-generated ID. Um, you can use generated uh, default as identity too, but I, I, I'd rather use always because it means that if you try to put something into ID, you will get an error. You can't do that. And if you want to do that, you will have to use the overriding system values to make sure that you will, uh, you, you know what you're doing and you're overriding the ID. Um, also, you can pass directly your data text column here into several. So here, the challenge was a poker game. So you have a hand and a hand is five letters or digits. So, for example, he, uh, you can have uh, A for Nace, G for Joker, 8 for 8, and so on. Uh, so you had five of them, which creates your hand in poker. And then I, the second, uh, the second uh, thing I had was just the bet and how much you had. So what I did is first I passed what is hand and what is the bet. So what's inferring is you can't reuse a generated column to create another generated column. You can't change them. So I couldn't here use uh, the hand generated column, but I could use the data one. And so here I was able to count how many S S's I had in my hand, or how many kings, how many queens, and so on. So that it was easier after to process my data. Um, so, regular expressions. They are very, very useful for passing, very, very powerful. But you know the say, when you have a problem you can solve with regular expression, you have actually two problems. So, yeah, and, and I had the third problem is I introduced regular expressions to my dad. So I got phone call. How can I do that with regular expression? I will send you a text message and then you will solve my, you will debug my regular expression and so on. And yes, my dad is retired, he has time. Um, so <laughs> that was fun. There are two operators that can do pattern matching in, uh, in Postgres, the tilde and the tilde star. The difference is here it's case sensitive, here it's case insensitive. And you have also the functions regrets like, which will give you a Boolean as a, an answer. And then you have a lot of other functions. Here you will count how many times you will find the pattern. Here you will uh, um, get the uh, matching pattern, but the, uh, you will 
you can say, I, will, I want the third time we have this pattern and so on. Here, you will just uh, look if it match or if it matches, you will get the pattern, the first one or all of them. Uh, you can replace, which is very powerful. Uh, that one is very useful too. You can split a string into an array using a regular expression as a separator of your uh, string. Same thing with split to table, but you will split it into a table instead of an array. And then you can do substring. Same thing with a pattern. So, uh, yeah, yeah, you have to look at the documentation. Yeah, yeah, for that, that's typically the, actually, I have this, uh, the, this documentation page pinned into my browser because yeah, uh, I, that one and the uh, functions index, because depending on the kind of data types, I was always looking, going through this. So for example, here I will look for uh, anything in my value column that has a letter of uh, four letters, exactly four letters. Um, uh, or here is the one we saw before, I will look in my hand how many kings I have. Then I ran into the filter clause. Actually, I had no idea this existed. So it's when you apply a work clause to an aggregate function. It can be very useful to pivot a table, and you will find out that you will have to pivot tables if you try to uh, solve advent of code. Um, so it does something like that, and the equivalent of things that I've had seen in SQL queries before is that. So you have a count can when uh, condition then one, so that you will sum all the results. So uh, if you uh, look at that example, we will generate a series of numbers between one and 10, but here we will count all of them unfiltered, and then we will count but filtering only the values that are below five. And you see you have only four. This is not my code. This is uh, Vic's code. Vic, you're there? Yeah. Uh, when I look at that, um, I felt very silly because instead of this eight simple lines of code, I had written four cities and 63 lines of SQL. So yeah, when you don't know something, you can lose a lot of time. And I don't talk about maintenance time for 63 lines of SQL and four cities and so on. Uh, actually, cities, I have, so with close, um, use them for better readability, and also it helps iterate naturally, because we know that it's a declarative language, but each time we go through steps, so we say, I will first get this kind of data, then I will work on that, or you can do the other way around. You can say, I need this final result, I can get this if I have this intermediate result. So you just create the structure of the city, but you don't uh, write it. You make as if it's already written so that you can uh, iterate on that. And then you will have to chain a lot of cities. As I said the, the, on the slide before, I used four, uh, four different cities chained one with another. So here is an example where um, and actually, that's the four cities I used to solve this, uh, uh, over, uh, this challenge uh, in a way that is overcomplicated. So each time uh, I uh, declare a name for the city, the columns. Uh, also, I recommend that you name the columns here instead of naming them as label in your SQL query. It will be easier to, to use them. Um, and don't forget the as keyword because the SQL language is not very consistent. There are times where as is mandatory and times where it's not. This is when it's mandatory. But don't worry, Postgres will tell you. So uh, then we can recurse, and that's where it becomes fun. So here is an example where I get, uh, I will send the one, uh, the numbers between 1 and 99. So first I get the value 1, onion all, uh, n plus 1, and so on, and then I will send them. So this is how you use 
a recursive uh, city, you don't forget the onion hole. Uh, fun fact, most of the time when people use onion, union, they mean union hole. Union will uh, remove distinct values. And that means that it won't perform as, uh, as good as union hole. Normally, when you think union, you shouldn't have duplicate between the first set and the second set. Um, I found another way to recurse that was easier to debug because the problem with that is debugging is not that easy. But when you do it in several steps, you can, uh, you can debug easily. So first you create a table, for example here. Then you create a stored procedure when you will iterate so you will get the, last val the next value and you will do that in place in your table. So either you do it that in place or you add a new row and you will add an iteration number so that you know at what iteration point you are. And then you simply call your procedure, so no, you don't call, you generate the SQL query that will call your procedure with several values and then you uh, execute it with the beautiful G exec uh, commands that I love. So uh, backslash T means that you will redo uh, the query that is in the query buffer. By writing the query here, it's in the query buffer. And exec means you will execute the result of your query. So as the result of my query is a query, then it will execute it. You might want to use set quick on set quick off it because you don't need to have call written 100 times on your screen. And so if you put everything together, we have the exact same thing than with the recursive city. But from time to time, I found that it was easier to write it that way. The problem that is that it does not perform as well as recursive city because it has to write. Or well, maybe I find it easier because my brain is tweeted, and that's fine. Um, oh, that function. So I knew that function existed for a long time, and I was struggling to find a real use case for it. Uh, so that's a standard SQL function, and what it does, it takes two arguments, one uh, argument one, argument two, and if they are equal, then it will return null. So it feels weird, uh, and if, it, if they are not equal, it will return argument one. Actually, I found out that when you're parsing a, um, a file, it's very useful to spot null values. For example, if you have a file where the null values are written as null, then you can, you can use the nullif value. So here it was because in my in my input, it was a space, was uh, a space in a specific position in the string was supposed to be null. So you can use null if la like that. If you have a space in that position, so if it's equal, then you will get null. If it's not, then you will have the value that's here. And yeah, uh, I, I really struggled to find a use case, but actually it is useful. When you're, when you're passing uh, data from an output source. Uh, comments. So, don't be shy with your comments because if, like me, you have to give a talk about this crazy thing and you look at your code one year after, you won't remember what you did, why you did it, and you will curse yourself. So, don't be shy, write a whole lot of comments. Uh, more comments than lines of code. It's okay, it's not production. It's not something you will share with others where you can do it in a private repo, it's fine. Um, and also, uh, I'm a very chatty person, so I'm chatty in my comments. And it helps clarifying my thoughts. And also, it helps reading the code. Um, also, so one thing I learned the hard way, because I'm not a very good Git user, don't remove from my code. Because sometimes I work for two hours and I then found out, uh, well, found out that my way of thinking thing was totally silly, so I took my 80 lines of SQL, put that into the trash and do it again, and found out that it was not that silly, but it's too late. 
So yeah, you can comment some lines of code. I know it's not clean, but you don't care. It's just a side project for fun. So this is the kind of uh, comments I have, and you see that I had my dad support uh, to solve advent of code, but he was doing it the easy way. He was doing that in Java, so that, that, there was no competition. Um, so the, the main goal of this talk was to, um, to tell you that you should try it because that's fun. And if I learned something is the main goal the main goal of life should be fun, having fun, because it can stop tomorrow. And no, I don't want to talk about this and be sad and so on, but it's just that, just have fun. And also, the great thing is you will learn so much. And I know that a lot of you love learning because, and are curious because else you wouldn't be scientists. So just try it out. And also, uh, I think that each time someone Talk to me about a new language. I tried it out on Advent of God. As I said, I, learned, I tried it on, on VLang. And uh, that's, best, that's a good way to see if, uh, how this language works. And it's better than Hello World because Hello World does not teach you anything, actually. Uh, also, it's OK if you can't solve a challenge. That's totally OK. Actually, I found out that. Uh, the Xcraft com community knows that. So Xcraft community is a community of developers uh, that think of software as a uh, craft, as an art of crafting. And they do uh, what they call kata, where they exercise themselves on uh, challenges and so on. And it's perfectly OK not to be able to solve the challenge. It's not a failure because the main point is not the destination, it's the journey. So just enjoy the journey. If you learn at least one thing, then it's worth it. Uh, also, I'm, uh, I love uh, clean code, smart code, but it does not mean that on a side project like that, you have to do that. So um, make your code work, even if it's not clever. For example, you've seen that I had hard coded that uh, uh, 20 in one of the examples, because I supposed that, uh, well, I looked at the full input and there was no more than 20 values. So don't try to find out how many values you will have to reinject that value into your SQL query so it can do more than 20 if your input says that there won't be more than 20. Uh, so make your code work, and it does not have to be the smartest code in the world. Uh, as long as you have fun, as you solve it, then you will be fine. Um, okay, so do you have any question? Hi, thanks for the talk. Uh, just one additional comment. Um, while you cannot vacuum analyze inside a transaction, you can actually analyze inside a transaction, and that's very helpful for some temp tables. Yes, uh, but I don't use temp tables because yeah, I wanted regular tables, uh, and actually, there, there aren't so many values. So uh, I said I will just try to vacuum analyze, and it does not take that much time. And actually, I found it's smarter mm -hmm. and cleaner to use a schema to sort everything, so that I can reuse the same uh, table names and so on. And uh, I've. I thought it was easier that way, and also it's easier to um, debug, because that way I have actual data I can work on. Uh, if I use a transaction and I roll back, then I will have to add my uh, debugging queries into my solution file, which is not that convenient. Mm -hmm. Anybody else got a question? So
So you are competing with your dad, who is using Java. <laughs> Do you have an idea how much longer or shorter your time to a solution is, and how much longer or shorter your code is then? Uh, no, I don't, but I know that I solved more challenges than him. So <laughs> that's already a success. <laughs> So on a similar note, I was, you said you tried it on a couple, of, a couple of different languages. Are there certain problems which fit SQL and certain problems which fit other languages? I, I haven't tried the advent of code yet. Uh, I like the idea of trying it in PSQL. Um, it's not PSQL, it's SQL using the client. But I could use any other client to run my code. OK. Yeah, I, I saw uh, quite a lot no, of No, I couldn't because I use backslash copy. Sorry, I use yeah. backslash comments. Uh, so no, it wouldn't run. I, I should, yeah, I should try the PG admin. Does PG admin uh, allow backslash comments, Dick? Do you know? No? The, okay. Uh, the, the question was more um, P, uh, yeah, SQL versus Python. Yeah. Are there certain problems which are always, is Python generally easier, or is sometimes SQL is a nicer solution? Um, Actually, um, the main author, author of Advent of Code uh, on Twitter last month said that it was not meant for SQL. So he's <laughs> not surprised that it's not. But, but uh, last year, the first of two changes were very easy in SQL. Cool. That's a good place to start. Yeah. And uh, it's, yeah, as I said, no pressure. It's for fun. So you do whatever you want. And if it's not fun anymore, you stop. That's OK. <laughs> we got any more questions? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I looked at your generate series usage, and I was wondering, did you have any exposure to APL, the A programming language, with its funny mathematical symbols? Uh, no. <laughs> like processing, uh, okay, because it's, I think it's similar to SQL in lots of thinking, and I've, you used some concepts, so I was thinking, okay. Okay, you. so that's a new thing I have to try out now. Thank you. <laughs> anyway. uh, so you said commenting is very important. Um, but I had some issues when commenting on views because we have some very old views and I had to change in case when and wanted to add the ticket number behind it so that if you look at it later, you can check where it comes from. Um, but it wouldn't save the comment for because no. Postgres doesn't save comments and spaces in views. So what's your best practice to yeah, add comments to views? You have to use SQL as if it was code. So it means that you have to put your SQL queries, including the one creating the views, in a repo with uh, several um, uh, yeah, version control and so on, so that you can uh, add your comments there. Also, you can add commit comments, and you can be very lengthened. So I think that's safer to do it that way and thinner. So we've got time for a couple more questions, if people have them. If not, I've got one. Why, why use the kind of loop and G exec rather than just a do block? I, I'm sorry. So you use G slash exec uh, yeah. and, a, and a loop. Why yeah. not just use a do block? A do block? Anonymous function. Oh, yeah, you can do that. You can generate a do block. Uh, no, but that's not SQL. That's not SQL. That's PLSQL. And oh, I'm okay. not allowed to use extension. And the PLSQL language is an extension. Semantics, eh? <laughs> You wanted me to cheat. <laughs> I mean, I would. Uh, I'm an SQL fan as, your, as yourself, and you know that. Uh, but I have a question that nobody answered me, never answered me. Uh, what do you think about the developers that try to go more SQL or more uh, functions, and they say, it's hard to debug when you're developing on SQL. What, do, what message do you have for them? Uh, first, I disagree. It's not hard to debug. That, that's <laughs> what they, they think. And, yeah, but uh, it's, it's always hard. It's, it's hard to, to integrate 
on CI, CD, for example. So uh, how do you handle that with your, your customers? First, it's always harder when you're not used to do something. Always. So, of course, the first times will be harder because you're not used to do, to do it. Your brain does not have the patterns and so on. So it will take more time, it will be less efficient, and sometimes it can be uh, tiresome. And uh, when you're already an expert developer in another language, then uh, it can blow your self-esteem down, and uh, some people don't like that. Uh, but, uh, and about the CI-CD thing, it's, uh, actually I've never tried that. Uh, but uh, debugging SQL is actually uh, easy. If uh, That's why I use the table and the stored procedure for my recursion from time to time instead of a CT, because I had, at each step, I had the result. So I could check that it was actually what I wanted. And, uh, uh, that's yeah, that's all. I, I I don't find it very difficult actually, uh, but maybe I would find uh, debugging in uh, whatever language, uh, Rust or Go or whatever. Maybe I f will find it hard. <laughs> so time for a couple more. If anybody's got a question. If not, I guess uh, thank you very much, Letitia, and uh, the round of applause.